a knell from the church bell broke harshly on his youthful thoughts. Another, again. It was tolling for the funeral service. A group of humble mourners entered the gate, wearing white favors, for the corpse was young. They stood uncovered by a grave, and there was a mother, a mother once, among the weeping train. But the sun shone brightly, and the birds sang on. Oliver turned homeward, thinking on the many kindnesses he had received from the young lady, and wishing that the time could come over again, that he might never cease showing her how grateful and attached he was. He had no cause for self-reproach on the score of neglect or want of thought, for he had been devoted to her service. And yet, a hundred little occasions rose up before him, on which he fancied he might have been more zealous and more earnest, and wished he had been. We need to be careful how we deal with those about us. When every death carries to some small circle of survivors thoughts of so much omitted and so little done, of so many things forgotten and so many more which might have been repaired, there is no remorse so deep as that which is unavailing. If we would be spared its tortures, let us remember this in time. Remorse is not a word you hear very often, not anymore, especially not from young people, not millennials. Maybe it's an old man's word. It comes with the accumulation of years and mistakes and losses and griefs, chances passed over, opportunities missed, remorse. It is a jagged word and it is terrible to speak remorse, deep regret or guilt for a wrong committed. Maybe it's just our culture. Maybe remorse is something that we don't feel anymore. Remorse has fallen out of our vocabulary. We don't hear it in conversation or in books or films. Has it fallen out of our lives as well? I hope not. Times past have not been kind to those who could feel no remorse. They were the villains the monsters. Feeling remorse is a sign that you have some good left in you, that you have a standard, that you know what is good, and you believe in the good, despite having done something wrong, despite having violated your standard. Remorse is the first step on the return path to goodness. Remorse is that feeling that tells us we have not lived up to our own standards, that we haven't done what we really wanted to do, or conversely, that we have done something that deep down, we really wish we hadn't. Remorse is what we feel when we judge ourselves by our own ideal. And this is why Soren Kierkegaard calls regret a friend, a guide in life, an expert. There is a solicitous guide, an expert, who makes one aware, who shouts to the wanderer so that he is on his guard. This guide, is regret. He is a trustworthy and sincere friend. Regret cares for us. It's looking out for us. It wants us to live the best life we can. It wants us to make the best possible choices in life. Regret is what helps us to be our true selves, the versions of ourselves that we really want to be. It calls to us, telling us where to go and what to avoid. So strange a power is regret, so sincere is its friendship, that there is in fact nothing more terrible than to have escaped it entirely. While some people might boast that they have no regrets, the reality is that to feel no regret is to give up on yourself, to not realize that your life can be more than it has been, that your life can be so much more. To live without ever feeling regret is to live without a higher vision for what your life could have been, and more importantly, for what your life can still be. If you change now, if you make that different choice, if you make more of yourself, regret 
is about constantly improving yourself and your life. It's regret that calls us to live the richest life that we can. The trick is not only to look backward and regret what you have done in the past, but to look forward as well in order to avoid doing anything we might later regret. This is what Charles Dickens encourages us to do by paying attention to the present moment and making sure that we do nothing we might later regret, to be careful with how we treat the people around us. Dickens gives us a solemn warning to spend each precious moment the best way possible. But of course, this is easier said than done. After all, how do we know what we will or won't regret in the future? In order to answer this question, Dickens uses a special tool called the novel. You see, a good writer, even when writing fiction, always tries to use the novel in order to portray reality by presenting not what has actually happened before, but by presenting what might happen in a certain situation. And this is a point made by Aristotle in his Poetics. The poets, or creators, function is to describe not the thing that has happened, but a kind of thing that might happen, i.e. what is possible as being probable or necessary. The distinction between historian and poet is that the one describes the thing that has been, and the other a kind of thing that might be. And this is what Charles Dickens does with his novels. He portrays life as it likely would be if we were orphans like Oliver Twist or David Copperfield, or miserly old men like Ebenezer Scrooge. Dickens' novels are almost biographical in the way they portray the life of human beings themselves, the way they follow his protagonists throughout their lives, sometimes even from childhood to adulthood, but always through formative experiences and relationships, sometimes loud and exciting, sometimes still and quiet. In so doing, Dickens portrays events that are very likely to happen to every one of us, like a marriage or an argument or a job interview. Sometimes he even portrays certainties, like death, in which case he tries to accurately portray how someone like you and me would feel and think after losing a friend. We would look back over our lives, just like young Oliver Twist, and see all the things that we failed to do, all the things that we wish we would have done. We would feel remorse. Dickens takes us through this experience so that we can go now and do more and be more zealous, more earnest, and omit nothing before we lose our friends and our loved ones. Dickens uses the novel in such a way that regret might transform our lives preemptively by stepping back and looking at the life of a fictional character, their loves and losses, victories and transformations. Dickens' novels help us learn to look at our own lives in the same way, to look at not just the past and present, but at the whole scope of what our lives might be, what they can be, and what they will be. Fiction helps us to imaginatively live our lives in advance, live events in our minds before they happen, so that we can live better now and avoid regret later. And in so doing, to live the best lives that we can. The novels of Charles Dickens do far more than merely entertain us. They encourage us to become tellers of our own stories, to craft the plots of our own lives before they happen, to conquer the present by paying attention to the future, and ultimately to tell a story with our lives that we will never regret. <laughs>